This is Upside Down in the Middle of Nowhere, chapters 38, 39, and 40. Me and Celie went the whole day without speaking to each other unless we had to, and I felt more alone than ever, and I, it was fixing to be lights out again, and the end of another long, frustrating day spent wasting away, lying on them cots, and walking in circles around tiles, trying to figure out up if in my head if I was going to find out, if go finding mom and daddy. Kayla still had the runs, and right after we ate disgusting tuna and crackers for lunch, she couldn't make it to the toilet in time. But don't you know, Miss Priscilla Nash showed up and some kind of fa- like some kind of fairy godmother with a new set of clean clothes. I helped little Kayla get into her pretty new dandelion yellow shorts, and the stretched out lime green headband didn't match, but it was from Mama's dress, so it stayed right where it was, and everything fit perfect. And Mama would have been happy that Miss Nash had got the right size, especially on her first try. As soon as Miss Medlin seen with her own two eyes how cute Kayla looked in new clothes, she asked if we all wanted some, and Celie jumped up and down so crazy it was embarrassing. If we would have, been, would have been on speaking terms, I would have told my sister she made a begging fool out of herself. Mima would have explained to Celie that our daddy provides us with everything we need on account of his hard work, and the Curtis family sure didn't need no handouts from nobody. But me and Celie wasn't speaking on speaking terms just yet. And I've been seeing folks grabbing and taking whatever was being handed out, whatever, whether they needed it or not. And I've seen one lady snatching up waters and shoving them into her shirt. I don't know why there was red-vested people handing out waters all day long like we were fish and couldn't survive without it. Daddy would be making sure we only took what we needed and relieving the rest for people that were less fortunate. When she came back with the bundles of new clothes from me and Celia, I was grateful. Miss Priscilla Nash didn't ask why when I set the stupid pile up under my cot. And I think the lady had asked and and admired how nice my sisters looked in their fresh new outfits. It was amazing how just by changing what they were wearing made such a difference. Y'all are so welcome. Ain't that something? How I got the sizes right and everything? It was obvious that Miss Priscilla Nash was just as pleased as Punch with her own do-gooding. Yes, ma'am, Celie gushed. I love my clothes. Thank you so much. And she ran over and wrapped her arms around the woman's waist. And I had to admit, my sister did look cute in her khaki shorts and lavender tank top. And Miss Nash had even brought her a little sandwich bag filled with new barrettes and hair ties. Oh, sweetheart, it's my pleasure. She squeezed, silly, and good, good and tight. She looked over at me, and I remembered to smile. Oh, Miss Nash said with such a start that she all but pushed Celie to the side. I almost forgot the most important thing. She looked at the floor from side to side until she found the white plastic bag. I could lose my head if it wasn't attached. And Celie giggled, and I watched somehow dreading whatever it was that the woman had up inside that bag. Miss Priscilla Nash hurried up and swept the bag to the back side of her like she was hiding it. And she cleared her throat and looked at me, big smile and all, and I felt sick. Armani, honey, I picked out those special for you, and I hope you like them. And out came the surprise from behind her desk. Well, what is it, Armani? And I opened the bag and knew before I, lo- I looked well, it, inside what it was. Well, what is it? And Celia could barely hold, keep hold of herself, and I closed the bag and held it out for Miss Madeline to take back. It was the color Tabasco Red crawled up inside a ripe banana brown neck and spread into her cheeks, turning the whole face purple. I I don't understand, she stuttered. I could see the strain it was for her to keep the ridiculous smile in place, and she never took the bag. And I wanted to get right up in her face and scream, you don't even know me, and you sure don't know nothing about my boots. What's wrong with the bag, Armani? Celie said, all nervous, looking from me, from, from me to the busybody woman. You don't want to know what's in the bag, Celie? And I snapped, never taking my eyes off Miss Nash. I flung the bag at my sister, and she caught it right away and looked inside. She held up new white sneakers with sky blue stripes, and this bag floated to the floor. Armani, it's just shoes. She said like she was giving me some new piece of information. I don't need new shoes, in case you all haven't noticed. I've got shoes, and I held one foot up to make sure they could see, and I shook my foot in the air, and the boot slid back and forth and almost fell off, and I put my foot back down, knowing I made my point. I tore my eyes from the confused-looking woman and shifted my mad at simple-minded C- my, my mad at simple-minded Celie, who didn't want to be my sister no more. She put the shoes back in the bag and gave it to Miss Nash so, no one, so, no one, so she can give them to someone who needs them. Celie just stood there staring. Armani, Miss Nash said, slow and direct, I'm here to help you. And a cry got stifled in her throat, but I can't help if you don't want to trust me. But why do you want to help us? We didn't ask for no help. You don't even know us. And my eyes stung, and I wish she'd stop looking at me with them soft eyes of hers. She took a step towards me, and I took a half step back, and she stopped and gave me a tiny soft smile with her head leaning to one's shoulder, and I couldn't look at her no more. Fine, whatever. I snatched the shoes out of Celie's hands, and I shoved them back in the bag and tied it shut. I put the bag back under the cot next to the pile of clothes, and I had no intention of wearing. 
And without taking my eyes off the floor, I said, okay, well, thank you. Miss Priscilla Nash kissed her own hand and touched my cheek with it. These things, things are going to get better, child, she whispered. The lights faded away, spreading the gray everywhere. It was aggravating the way the huge lights hugging in the ceiling buzzed even louder at night than they did during the day when they were on full blast. But every night at nine o'clock, somebody hit a switch somewhere and turned out, turned our new sit and wait world the colors of nightmares. Up in my head, when I talked to myself, I just started using the word hell. I didn't think Jesus would hold it against me on account of I wasn't letting the word leave my mouth. And besides, I figured he already knew the truth about where we were anyhow. I was lying on the rock uh, on the rock cot, missing my life when nine when I was nine when Celie's voice came floating over my way and she was telling droopy eyed Kayla a story. Uh, but the part that made my eyes perk up and pay attention was when she said it must have looked like this to Pinocchio when she found himself upside the whale's belly. I pushed on one elbow so I could look over to where Celie was stroking Kayla's forehead, staring up at the gray soaked ceiling whale's belly. That's exactly what it looked like and felt like. And it smelled like, too, all musky and poopy and stinking like someone burned the red beans. And I wondered what them sneakers felt like on the inside. And I pushed all the air out of my lungs and breathed a deep breath. And I rolled over and said goodnight in my head to Daddy and Mama and Georgie and Tay-Tay and Mima up in heaven. And I forced myself to go to sleep again. Chapter 39. This is Thursday, September 1st, 2005 at 628 in the morning. You must have prior approval to board the transport unit departing for Houston at 11 a.m. If you don't have an authorization code, please report to the transfer counselors immediately repeating the first bus bound for Houston, Texas will depart promptly at 11 a.m. You must have prior approval. The voice boomed through the stuffy morning shelter air and I flipped onto my belly and tried to fold the stupid paper pillow over my head to cover my ears and I opened one eye. Celia was standing over me holding her journal, looking down with a look of worry spread across her face that I plopped over and sat straight up. What's wrong? Were you crying and kicking your sleep again? No, I wasn't. Yes, you were. You can ask them. I didn't have to know she was pointing at three ma uh, mamas. They were always staring and whispering and shaking their heads like it was their job to watch over us. Kayla's head popped up off the cot like it was on springs and I moaned and I wasn't ready to get up yet. Even though my stomach was growling, begging for food, I wasn't ready to start another long day of lugging fussy Kayla back and forth to the stinking bathroom, knowing good well that something was wrong with her, and knowing that at the same time there wasn't I could, nothing I could do about it without exposing the truth about my family, and I reached over and pushed Miss Kayla's head back down on her cot and tried to shush her back to sleep. I think Kayla needs to use the bathroom, Celie said in a tired voice and sat down next to Kayla, and the girls didn't have no good reason for being anything but rested. I squeezed my eyes shut and said, well, then go on and take her. It would have been nice to see her do something to help me out with her sister. Never mind, Silly said. I don't think she has to go anywhere anymore. She never took her face out from between the swirly green and white cover of her thumb, dumb journal. And I, I stared at her wishing I was still a little kid so I could sit at the scribble, sit and scribble in a book all day. Kayla, do you need to use it? I've only been up a few minutes and I was already aggravated. No. Good, I mumbled to the air. Then I'm going to go. And I scooted and hopped and puffed and slapped at the crinkly, useless pillow, fussing the whole time trying to get my off my idiotic cot. You can't leave us here, Sealy said in a sealy way. I'm too young, remember? And I wasted one of the best cut, uh, crusty looks I've ever made when I threw it over at Sealy, and she didn't even see it because the girl never looked up once as far as I could tell. Kayla came walking up behind me, and I turned around pointing my finger. No, Kayla. From behind their journal, Celie said all sweet, like, come and see, Kayla, come see, sissy. Kayla turned around and headed back to Celie, and I was fixing to tell her to put the journal away and pay attention to her baby sister. But right then, she set the book down and planted them sad puppy eyes on hers of me. Are you really going to leave us by ourselves? It turned away and started walking. I'm so sick of doing everything. Can't I just go to the bathroom by myself one time? I was so wore down. Y'all be fine. You got them to watch you. And I let out a tired sigh and waved to the three happy mamas. I hated to be on that side of the shelter, and there were too many red vests and too many sets of eyes and ears, and I wiped beads of sweat off my forehead, and I was thankful to the short line, and I got in and out of the bathroom quick so I could hurry up and get back to the corner where I felt safe. Attention, the first bus bound for Houston, Texas, will depart promptly at 11. I don't know why they kept making the same announcement over and over again. I didn't do nothing but add to the noise, and I was trying to make my way through people and fuss when a big old woman pushed past me. Based on the size of her, it was a good thing that she didn't find no part of me with her feet, or I would have been crushed to death for sure. <coughs> Excuse me. 
hey, I hollered, but by the time the words left my mouth, all I could see was the woman waddling away as fast as her short legs could go with a crying kid on her shoulder and with a kid with a daffodil yellow short set. My heart knocked, knocked, knocked up inside my chest. Hey, are you okay? Someone touched my shoulder and I shook my eyes off the huge backside, shifting side to side as crazy as women zigzag through the room with cots and people. And my head went to thumping and I tried to take off running, but I tripped over my own boot covered foot and fell to the floor. Whoa, girl, slow down, a person said, grabbing a hold of my arm. I, I can. I think that woman has my baby sister. And panic filled my whole body when I said the words out loud. What? I finally looked at the annoying stranger in the face, and I blinked not to get lost in the ocean of blue of the boy's big eyes. I searched my brain for the kid's name. What are you doing here? Chapter 40. The Bowman kids couldn't believe my eyes, and the last time I'd seen them kids were all tucked up inside the tire, drifting off to who knows where. Now they're here, all four of them lined up like st stair steps, from the tallest one down to the shortest. And the name of the boy who grabbed hold of my arm didn't, co didn't come to me because I never knew it to begin with. What's wrong? You okay? The oldest boy, Bowman boy asked, and I pointed to the muck of people. I don't know. I started thinking maybe I'd seen all I'd seen was a rude fat woman trying to get trying to run with a girl who happened to be dressed in yellow, and maybe the red vested folks were handing out daffodil yellow shorts to all the little girls. And I stopped pointing and adjusting my shirt that was stuck to me like I was made of flypaper. Kayla is safe with Seely, and I started chanting up in my head. You sure look scared. And the Bowman, Bowman boy's voice had a nice, even tone that even Mima would have compared to butter. I'm not scared. I tried to keep my lip from curling like it was some, uh, curling up like it sometimes like to do. And it was just a case of mistaken identity. And I reached up with my free hand and made an attempt to smooth the hair bumps all over the top of my head. And I wished I could have took half a second to check myself into a bathroom mirror when I had the chance. The Bowman boy smiled a gap to smile. Well... Who was that and you mistakenly identified? And the three Bowman kids were making me uncomfortable just standing there watching and not minding their own business, and I had half a mind to shoo them away. Oh, it was nothing. The feel of my smile was strange, and I went to swing side to side. Well, what happened was I was just walking along when some huge, rude woman flew by me and about knocked me down, and she was fussing the run off of my baby sister Kayla in her arms, and I let out a nervous giggle that sounded more like Seely than me, but I couldn't have been her because she wears a lime green headband uh made from the hammer mama's dress and that baby girl didn't have one i wished more than anything right then that i could stop rambling please let kayla would be with silly man she must have been that must have been scary the boy had a dimple that played hide and seek right along his mouth i know how you feel he said looked over at his brothers and sisters if anyone ever tried to mess with one of mine i don't know what i'd do his voice had calming effect to me and I closed my eyes and concentrated on just my nose, and I took a real long whiff, and I moved my head back and forth to try and stir up any smells that might be trying to hide. And all I smelled was shelter, pure and simple mildewy shelter. What I didn't smell was onion water. I smiled, and the happiness of knowing the smell was, wasn't there spread all the way across my face. I opened my eyes, and there were four sets of blue eyes watching me, like I was a, a mime on Bourbon Street. Hey, are you okay, Armani? He knew my name. How do you know my name? I hope I didn't look like Miss Priscilla Nash and her plastered smiley self. He shrugged his shoulders. I don't know. I do, I guess. The Bowman girl stepped up. She was wearing a lavender tank top, just like Seely's new one, and the shirt filled me with relief. And if there was one more, if there was more than one lavender colored tank top, it made sense that there'd be one more than one daffodil yellow short set. The girl tugged on her big brother's sleeve. Matthew, can we go now? I'm hungry. His name was Matthew. Attention residents, you must have prior approval to board the transport unit departing for Houston, Texas at 11 a.m. If you do not have an authorized code, the stupid recorded voice echoing, echoing through the air set my nerves in motion again. What if that fat lady with the kid dressed in yellow was running to catch a bus? Well, I must be, guess, but must be getting back, and I nodded and started to take a step. Matthew took a step with me, and he laid his hand on my arm. Armani, he said with a hushed voice. He looked around, and I knew, I knew that look. He didn't want anyone to overhear what he was fixing to say. Are y'all done? Are y'all y'all alone? I mean, what's your mama? Where's your mama and daddy? Truth potion must have been pouring out of his blue eyes because without even considering my answer, I shrugged. He asked to. He swung his head from side to side, moving the hair out of his eyes. Our foster auntie mama got crushed by a tree, he said, like he was telling me what, it, what he had for supper. The other three Bowman kids had their heads hanging, all in blonde hair swooping down on their floor, to the floor. She couldn't get out of the way fast enough in her wheelchair, crushed like poor Miss Tilly. 
I couldn't think of one thing to say right then. So anyway, Matthew said, this is my sister Martha and my brothers Lukey and little John. And one of the mini Matthews looked up from under his wavy hair. And I could tell by the way you looked at them that Matthew had special feelings for each one. Lukey won't talk. He ain't said one word since the tree fell. And the boy named Lukey stared at the floor. Even with all that hair covering half his face, I could still see the cute in him showing through. How old are you? I asked Martha. He twirled long, honey-colored hair around his finger, and I was thinking about how much I'd love to braid that hair, and the braid would come clear to the middle of her back. I'm seven, he said, all proud. I like your boots. Oh, thanks. They're my Mima's. Seely, my Celie's seven years old, too. You'll like her. Everybody does. Celie was going to be so excited to have someone her own age to talk to. I wondered if Martha liked books, and I was fixing to ask her when Matthew spoke. Is Georgie with y'all? My whole body stung when he said, that, said my brother's name, and the heat ran out of my face. Me and him have math class together. He's funny. Mm. Did a tree fall on him? Little John piped up. His eyes were so sad, and I blinked the sting from my eye. All I wanted to do was get back to my sister's. Matthew leaned in and whispered, What happened to Georgie? My faces were so close, I could feel the air coming out of his nose. I don't know where Georgie or my daddy is, and I swiped a tear that ran down my cheek, and I knew that when I seen the look on Matthew's face that I'd tell him everything, but not in front of them sad little boys. My arms felt empty for the first time in a long while, and I was grateful when Lukey, the boy, didn't talk and came over to look at my hand of the, uh, took my hand in the two of his. Martha smiled, smiled a sweet, sweet smile, and Matthew grinned. He must like you because he doesn't talk to many people. And I squeezed the little boy's hand. Well, I like him too. I don't talk to many people either. And Lukey didn't smile, but when he looked up at me, he seen the possibility of happy sneak up into his eyes. Matthew sniffed shook the bangs out of his face and cleared his throat. So it's just you and your sisters? Well, we have Mr. High Pockets. Do you all want to meet him? And that's the, that is the end of chapter 40.